that I may know him, Paul said, in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. Paul said, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Savior. Ever nearer, as we get toward the end of this year, that question comes up. How has this year been spiritually for you? We ebb and we flow. It's a part of life. It's a part of having these feet of clay, but are you nearer? Are you drawing nearer? Are you pressing inward to the Lord? Are you closer today than you were a year ago? You can take your Bibles this morning with me, please, and turn to 1 Timothy 5. I mentioned last week, the title of the sermon last week, or the... the, the uh, Scripture we were in was 1 Timothy 5, 3 through 13, 13, and I had mentioned that it was a part one, sort of a part one. It's two distinct messages, but the same passage of Scripture. Recall a couple of weeks ago I preached uh, in 1 Timothy 5, verses 1 and 2 about the importance as a church of being family, of treating one another of such, of having a determined relationship one with another. And the second point of our application was stop being so private. And I had mentioned at the time that the concept there is not that we are to be in one another's business, but rather that we are to uh, allow ourselves among those who are invested in the church to have a measure of vulnerability so that we are helping one another grow. We can't help each other if we don't know each other. We can't help each other if we aren't honest with each other. I can't help you if I don't know what you're going through. You can't help me if you don't know what I'm going through. We have to invest in one another if we're going to help one another. And we're supposed to help one another. And I had mentioned there, as I just uh, alluded to, that in that sermon I said we are to be investing in one another, but that doesn't mean we're supposed to be in each other's business, right? And we're going to come back to that idea, that concept today. Last week we exposited verses 3 through 16, explained them, walked through them together, talked about some of the elements of the scope of the limits of church authority and responsibility as it relates to the family. We talked about widows indeed. We talked about the responsibility of the church to the widows indeed. And we spent a good amount of time talking about what a widow indeed is and what a widow indeed is not. And we, we saw how the uh, primary accountability for a widow would be to her, uh, fr from, from her family, from her children, from her grandchildren. They are accountable to take care of her. The family is the first line of social defense as it relates to uh, taking care of these things. But then if she was one who her family was either unable or unwilling to help her, and then she was a woman who was willing to take, uh, to, to devote herself to this, this life of piety, and if she were a woman who had been faithful to the church, uh, then it would be appropriate for the church thus to take upon themselves the responsibility of caring for her if no one else would. And we talked about that as it relates to widows. We talked about that as it relates in broader terms to church support and our philosophy and our thinking as it relates to church support. Now, another one of those qualifications that Paul gave as a measure of standard is he had mentioned that a woman should not be taken in and fully cared for who was under three score years or 60 years of age. And as Paul exhorted, he exhorted the women who were under 60 years of age that they should remarry, that they should take care of a family, lest they being unmarried and being young wax wanton against Christ. And the danger there was, was that, that they would become unfaithful, whether that be through, through uh, well, primarily through idleness. And then that could lead to any number of problems. It could lead to a wantonness, that word there having an implication, uh, not just of idleness uh, or, or, or of diversion, but of a diversion of a, of, a, of a sinful nature. So Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 9 through 14, let not a widow be taken into the number under threescore years old, having been 
the wife of one man, well reported of for good works, if she have brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, if she have washed the feet of the, uh, the saints' feet, if she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work, but the younger widows refuse. For when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. The idea there being that this idleness will lead her into a sinful lifestyle um, if she is not led into a measure of responsibility and accountability. Verse 13, And with all, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies speaking things which they ought not. I will, therefore, that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. So Paul warns in these verses about the nature of idleness and the negative characteristics that idleness inspires. He warns about the danger of damage done with the tongue through tattling, through idle gossip, through busybodying, if you will. And the particular reason why Paul says this is so dangerous is not just because the woman herself is thus uh, inspired to live in this manner which is sinful, but he says, giving none occasion to the adversary to speak, to speak reproachfully. Through these things, there is an occasion for the adversary to speak reproachfully. And God forbid that we as a church should give place, even for a moment, to a disposition that would shame the name of Christ. And it is this that I would like us to consider in our time together today. I'd like us to use this concept which we find in verse 13. Paul presents it very matter-of-factly in this context, so much so that these attributes should set the tone for an entire line of doctrinal thinking, and through it learn about the tremendous power that each of us has through the words that we say and through the disposition that we carry ourselves with in the church. And I'd like to begin today by defining what it is that Paul speaks of. What he's speaking about, what he's speaking against in these verses. So Paul's warning for those who are young and unmarried, having been widowed, is that they would be tempted if they're widowed and if they were taken into the church, if they were uh, devoted to a life of piety, uh, very similar to what we see in Anna the prophetess in the New Testament where she lived in the temple, where she devoted herself to fasting and to prayer and that sort of an idea. If they devoted themselves to a measure of piety within the church, if they were taken care of by the church, the temptation would be because she is idle to wax wanton. That word idle there literally means to be free from labor. In various senses, it can effectively mean to be lazy, to have no responsibility placed upon you or to not li be living out the responsibilities that have been placed upon us. The old adage goes, idle hands are the devil's plaything, right? Idle hands are the devil's plaything. And there's any number of, of other uh, ways that that is expressed. The that's really the idea behind this warning that Paul is speaking of here. Those that have learned to be idle. An idle person, an idle society, an idle culture is a person, a society, a culture which will begin to decay. I, idleness lends itself to decay. Idleness lends itself to sin. We see as people get older, maybe they retire. One of the things that, that we find that's very important is that people stay busy, right? That they keep their mind busy, that they keep their body bu busy. Because when a person stops being busy, when they stop keeping their mind and their body busy, it kind of just begins to decay. Well, there's a spiritual element to this as well. That when you or I or a society or a culture stops being busy, when we allow ourselves to be overtaken in an idleness, there's a real spiritual danger that presents itself. And we can see this in our culture very clearly, can't we? Over the past century, there has been a tremendous idleness that has found its way into our culture. Work that used to demand of us our time is now being done with increasing speed and efficiency. What used to take someone uh, uh, many, many hours takes significantly less now to perform with computers, with automation. Many jobs 
that people used to have have been completely taken out of our hands. The farmer no longer walks behind the plow. The farmer has the machinery to do the work. And this efficiency has led to a state of affairs in our country where we have a lot of time on our hands. A lot more than people used to have. It's also led to a situation where particularly young people are not as compelled. It is not nearly as, as important for young people to contribute to the prosperity of the family as one time it was. So that young people are growing up particularly idle with very little responsibility. A great number of things that used to command the time of, of the women and the children in the family have now been given over to appliances. A great number of things that were man's contribution to the family have now been given over to tools. And so, again, it's not that these things aren't getting done. It's that they're getting done so quickly that we have a lot of time on our hands. And this has led to a tremendous moral decay. It's been a part. It's contributed. I wouldn't say led to. It's contributed to a tremendous moral decay within our culture as people seek to fill their time. You see these marches, all these people on social media that are all up in arms about this and that and the other thing, and you say, well, why don't you just go do something all right, with your time? You've got way too much free time on your hands if you're doing all of these things. Go do something with your time. But you know, we are in a culture where we're going to have time. We don't need, we're not a subsistence living culture, are we? You don't need to work in order to live every day. There's a lot of time that is up in the air. Such is the case with cultures and extension of the idleness of individuals. And it often lends itself to sin. We've all experienced the increased amplitude of temptation that comes when you're bored. You've experienced this, right? You have a particular struggle in your life. You're dealing with a particular besetting sin. And when you're bored is a time where those sins tend to be the most difficult to resist. You've got nothing better to do, and so you fall back into old habits. You've got nothing better to do, so you fall back, fall back into old routines. You want those routines gone, and it is in idleness that those routines tend to find strength. We can see it in ourselves. We can certainly see it in our children, right? One of the things that I've learned as my children are growing is that bored children is not a good thing, right? I don't want my children to get bored because when my children get bored, they get creative. And when my children get creative, it tends to end up with somebody hurting someone else or somebody doing, uh, cl climbing something they're not supposed to or throwing something they're not supposed to or whatever the case may be. They have a lot, if, if, if children have discretionary time where they're not being directed into something useful, into something profitable, then they're going to direct themselves and that's going to probably bring them to a place where they are going to cause some trouble. If my son gets bored, he might say, hey, I wonder what my sisters are doing. And I wonder if I could get one of my sisters to react to something that I'm doing, right? And then we have a conflict on our hands because my son got bored. This happened because this time is not being utilized more profitably or in a more productive manner. And while we can look at such anecdotal evidences to understand the point, there is little to no denial of this point, not just when we observe the tendencies in our own lives, but we can also see it very clearly taught in the scriptures. We see the principle laid out here. The idea that Paul says when somebody has no particular use, especially when they're younger and they're, 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 there's, there's a vigor to them and they get idle, there are temptations there that they would not otherwise face. That, they, that would not otherwise present themselves. But there is another really strong biblical authority to, this, to these claims that I'd like for us to spend a little bit of time studying this morning. Sodom is presented in Scripture as the picture of absolute spiritual unfaithfulness and moral depravity. If you want to think of an evil woman in the Scriptures, you, you think of Jezebel, right? Right? In Jewish culture, if they think of an evil man, they think of Haman. 
Well, if you want to talk about an evil city or an evil culture, if you want to, if you want to describe a culture and you want to use the most powerful or, 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 or uh, uh, clear terms of depravity to describe a culture, you say that that culture or that city is Sodom, right? We would describe, well, there, there was a time where you would describe only singular cities as Sodom. Uh, not so much in our culture anymore, but there was a time where you'd say, yeah, Las Vegas, that, that place is Sodom, right? You'd say San Francisco, that place is Sodom. You'd describe it as a place of deep, moral depravity, and you'd use that term Sodom to describe it. If God wanted someone to understand just how sinful and idolatrous and unrighteous they had become, he would compare them to Sodom. So God calls Israel at times Sodom. Jesus tells Bethsaida and Chorazin, it'll be more tolerable for you in the day of judgment than for Sodom and Gomorrah, right? And so we have this idea once again that Sodom and Gomorrah, they are, they are an archetype. They are the pinnacle. They are an example of evil and of depravity and of rebellion in the scriptures. Now we're introduced to Sodom way back in Genesis 18. And God says to Abraham in verses 20 and 21, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which has come unto me. And if not, I will know. So God describes the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah as one which is great and which is grievous unto him. And he's going down so much so that he intends to go and to visit the city. And if all, that, that, all of the sin that cries out into the city is in fact evident and obvious, then the city will be absolutely destroyed. Now we know here that uh, Abraham seeks to intercede for the sake of his nephew Lot. And he gets down to, if there were 10 righteous men in the city, would you, would you spare the city? And he says, I would spare it for 10. And in Genesis 19, we find this set of events play out. Two angels, they go into the city. Lot invites them to come in off the street. They say, no, 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 we'll stay in the street. And Lot says, no, 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 why don't you come in? So he, he, he is inviting them in, at which point we read in verses 4 and 5 of Genesis 19. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, where are the men which came into thee this night. Bring them out unto us that we may know them. The angels were in Lot's house and the men of the city, the Bible says both young and old. So this wasn't a generational issue. This was a city-wide thing. This was the young men. This was the old men. This was acceptable. This was normal. This was the, the character of the city. They surround the house. They call out to Lot and they say, hey, there were two men that came into your house today. They're traveling. You're hosting them. We give them to us so that we can rape them. And Lot says, no, don't do this. They're my guests. This is evil. This is wrong. Don't do this evil. He offers them his daughters. That's a problem for another day. And he insists that they cannot have these two travelers. And they say, well, if we can't have the two travelers, then we'll take you. And they seek to rape Lot at which point the angels blind the eyes of the men and they deliver Lot from that fate. And this circumstance naturally is enough for the angels to say, we're going to destroy this city. And so God rains down fire and brimstone upon the city. Does he get down to five righteous? I said 10. Does he get down to five? No? 10? Okay. Okay. The angels deliver Lot from this fate. And so Sodom thus becomes throughout the Old Testament the deepest picture of spiritual idolatry and of moral depravity. We even uh, call uh, those who are a part of the lesbian or homosexual agenda Sodomites as a reference to this city. Now, as we consider Sodom, as we consider the idolatry, as we consider the sexual depravity of that city, there's only one place in the scriptures where the essence, the root of what brought Sodom to the place of, their, of that depravity bubbles up to the surface. And that is in Ezekiel 16. 
Ezekiel 16, in my opinion, is one of the most beautiful chapters of Scripture in the whole Bible. But it's only because of the end. <laughs> the rest of it's kind of ugly. In Ezekiel 16, we find God described the whole history of his dealings with the nation of Israel, and specifically with the nation of Judah, the southern kingdom of Judah. And he uses uh, a metaphor of a man who uh, is meant to represent God, who found an abused and a neglected woman, and that is meant to represent Judah. And the Bible says that he cleaned her and he healed her wounds. He found her and she was wallowing in her own blood. And he found her and he cleaned her wounds and he clothed her in the finest of clothes and he taught her and he blessed her and she was beautiful and he married her. And then the Bible recounts that she, seeing her beauty, becomes proud and selfish. And so she prostitutes herself out to anyone and everyone. She becomes unfaithful to him. And she takes her jewels that he gave her. And with those jewels, she makes idols. And she takes those clothes which he clothed her with, the beautiful garments, and she dedicates them to others. And within this context, God tells Judah that she is unfaithful just as her sisters are. And he says, you have an older sister and you have a younger sister. And he says, your older sister is called Samaria. And that represents the northern tribes of Israel. Samaria being the capital of those northern tribes. He says, your older sister is Samaria. And he says, your younger sister is Sodom. And so he says, Judah had walked in the ways of her sisters into unfaithfulness to him. So he describes Judah in these terms, and Samaria, in, in these terms of sisters, and in these terms that reflect Sodom. And it's within this context, as God likens Judah to her younger sister Sodom, that God describes the nature of Sodom's descent into absolute moral decay. We read this in Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 49 and 50. The Bible says this, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy, and they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. Notice the description of the iniquity of Sodom. Sodom was proud. She was full of bread. And because she was full of bread and because she was proud, Sodom was also not a subsistence living culture. Sodom was a wealthy culture. Sodom was a wealthy city. Sodom was, was not a city where, where they had to go out every day and, and, and concern themselves simply with living that day. They were idle. They were full of bread and they were proud. And because they were idle and because they were selfish, they didn't care for the poor and the needy. They, 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 they had full, they, they had to the full. They were wealthy, but they were not compassionate. They were wealthy, but they were not generous. They were selfish, they were proud, and they were idle. And because the society was selfish, proud, and idle, they devolved into abominations. And the abomination that we see they devolved into was the sexual perversion of homosexuality. And this sealed God's judgment upon them. So their judgment was for their sin. The manifestation of their sin, the manifestation of the depths into which they had gone was sodomy. But that was not the root the root of that sexual perversion was that they were a society that was proud, idle, and selfish. And their idleness, combined with their wealth, brought about sin and selfishness. And this is the warning that is at the root of Paul's exhortations in 1 Timothy that there is no righteous good to come from idleness. 
And in this case, the danger that Paul espouses is not explicitly sexual in nature. We do see the idea in the word wanton. We definitely see an idea of uh, 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 an implication of sexual sin. If you look at the definition of the word wanton as it's translated, we don't necessarily see that in the essence of the Greek word. We see it in the essence of the translated word. And yet here, the, the danger, the warning is not so much that these women are going to invariably fall into deep sexual perversion, but there is a warning here about the nature of idleness and sin. We see the fullness of that warning in the example of Sodom. But we also see a warning here. Paul says these women, having no husband, if they learn to be idle, will roam from house to house, finding companions and engaging in tattling and gossip. The concept of tattling is much or excessive talking. We have any number of ways to describe such people. People that love the sound of their own voice, sometimes we describe them that way. People who always have to have the last word, that's another way we describe people that talk a lot. People that speak without thinking or speak before they think or speak first and think later. That's another way we describe people that have a tendency just to talk. People who are not judicious with their words. And the scriptures are once again clear in their warning that such a tendency within us and among us is, is very real. Humans, this is not an uncommon tendency among humans. Right? Proverbs chapter 10, verse 19 warns us, In the multitudes of words there wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. Those who speak quickly and often will often find themselves saying things which they regret. Those who speak without thinking, those who speak uh, impulsively, those who speak often, those who speak just to speak, those who always have to have a word in the conversation, those who always have to have something to say, there's danger there. The scriptures tell us whether they, whether that danger is that someone will be hurt by their words or they speak and propose error at the expense of truth or they speak to things that they simply know nothing about and so they just get things wrong because they're speaking to things that they don't understand. This can cause damage to oneself and to others and bring about any number of terrible consequences. And so we have this idea of tattlers. The idea of tattlers is simply someone who doesn't refrain from speaking, who babbles, who utters in vain, who says things. They, they're, they're not saying anything of value. They're not saying anything of worth, but they're going to talk anyway. That's a danger. The second one, worse so, that of being a busybody. The concept is once again found throughout the scriptures and used in any number of contexts. And I say the concept is used because the word itself that we find here is very rare. Used only here and in one other passage. And in that passage, it's not even translated anything like busybody. It's actually translated curious arts, speaking of magic or witchcraft. But the concept is found in many places. And naturally, they're all in the negative. We see a glimmer of these things in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 10 through 12, where the Bible says this, And indeed ye do it toward all the brethren which are in Macedonia. Paul is commending them. But we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more, and that ye study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that ye may walk honestly toward them that are without and that ye may have lack of nothing. Here Paul exhorts the church to increase more and more. And as he does so, he defines this idea, what, what it means to increase more and more to the church by saying this, study to be quiet, care about your own business, and work with your own hands. And we're going to find as we continue our study into 2 Thessalonians here in a moment that this was a problem in the church of Thessalonica. Each church had their own issues. The, the Corinthian church was a church that was deeply carnal, Right? When they, they were attached to the world and they had a love for the world and that, that was their stumbling block. Thessalonica was a church where there was a temptation unto idleness, unto being a busybody, unto not working, not laboring with their own hands, unto a laziness of sorts. And this was the temptation within their city. And so he says, study to be quiet, learn, learn to keep your mouth shut, do your own business, 
stay out of other people's affairs, and work with your own hands. And that with two particular results. The first result, you walk honestly toward them that are without. You have a good testimony. And second, you can provide for yourself. You work with your hands. You keep your mouth shut so that you have a good testimony among them that are without. And so that you, are, so that you can care for your, yourself. Now, by the time Paul writes 2 Thessalonians, this exhortation, this command becomes a rebuke. They obviously didn't listen to him very well after reading the first epistle. And so in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 10 through 14, we read this. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should you eat. So Paul referenced that in 1 Thessalonians, right? He referenced that in 1 Thessalonians 4. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busy bodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. So Paul uses quite strong and decisive language here. In the first, he, he, had, he had visited them before he wrote 1 Thessalonians. He had seen that they were idle. He had seen that there were people that were not working. He'd seen that there were people that were perhaps living off the dole, living off of someone else's generosity or whatever the case may be. He had seen that there were people who were into other people's business, that it was a culture of gossip, that it was a culture of, of vain speaking. And so he writes and he says, as we commanded, so do work with your own hands. Stay out of other people's business and study to be quiet. Now we're in 2 Thessalonians and Paul says, look, when we were worth, w with you, there was a problem and we hear that there's still a problem in the church and now we need to take things to the next level. Now he is openly rebuking them. He says there are people who are not working and if they don't work, they shouldn't eat. Don't support them. Don't continue to help them. Don't let them live in this way. And speaking to those who have foregone working, he says, instead of doing that work, spend your time working. He said, there are those who are walking in disorder, disorderly among you, because they're not working, and instead they're busybodies. And this is a different word. It means to move about uselessly, to busy oneself with useless matters. You're doing a bunch of stuff that doesn't matter. You're wasting your time, Paul says. Now, it's worth noting that while we, we do see the same word here translated, busybody, it is a different Greek word. He says, instead, you're meddling in the affairs of others. You're putting yourself into circumstances and situations that you have no right, no business, no purpose to do so. And Paul calls for the church to exhort them in this manner. Shut your mouths, work hard with quietness, and provide for yourselves and eat your own bread. Paul says, do that. And within this context, in verse 14, notice the gravity, notice the strong language here. He says after this, be not weary in well-doing. And then he says, and if anyone does not obey this, if after I have written this second letter to you, there are still people who don't want to work and who want to meddle in other people's affairs and who want to be busybodies, note those people and have no company with them that they may be ashamed. If a man refuse to obey those exhortations, the church should identify them and should withhold from them their company, not maliciously, not in a judgmental way, but rather unto the end that they would realize that what they're doing is unacceptable and that they would repent, that they'd get right, that they'd be restored, that the shame would bring him unto repentance. Peter also speaks of this concept in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. He says, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Peter here makes a definitive contrast between types of suffering. He says, none of us should suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer. That doesn't mean that murderers, thieves, and evildoers shouldn't suffer. What he's saying there is none of you should be that way and thus come to suffering. There's a problem if your suffering, if your suffering is because of these things, it's self-inflicted. And notice he adds to murder, theft, and evil doing, being a busybody. You shouldn't, you shouldn't have those in your midst, Paul sa or Peter says here. 
He says, now, if you suffer for Christ, that's a suffering that you need not be ashamed of. That's a suffering that you can bear, as we sang this morning, uh, the old rugged cross. That's a suffering that, that you can bear with joy. But don't suffer for evil doing. We see another word here, a third Greek word translated busybody, meaning to supervise affairs belonging to others. Busybody is the close relation to the tattler and the gossip. They whisper in quiet about others, the things which are not their concern. They seek to put themselves into situations of which they have no business. And there are any number of words for these types of men and women in the Bible. We've seen busybody. We've seen tattler. We've mentioned gossip. Also whisperer. The Bible uses the word whisperer. The word is found both in Romans chapter 1, verse 29 and 2 Corinthians 12, 20 to speak of those who slander or tear down others behind their backs. The common Old Testament word, which speaks sort of to this end, is talebearer. That speaks of someone who's saying things which are not true. A gossip is not necessarily speaking things which are not true. A gossip can be saying things which are entirely true. When someone comes up and says, I'm not gossiping, I'm just telling you the truth. Well, that, that's not necessarily true. <laughs> Just because it's true doesn't mean it's not gossip. Just because it's true doesn't mean that that person you're telling it to has any business hearing it, has any business in that affair, needs to know. They don't, if they don't need to know, they don't need to know. And so we see in Proverbs, Proverbs 11, verse 13, a talebearer revealeth secrets, but he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. Proverbs 18, 8, the words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. Notice in that first verse, the talebearer is revealing secrets. These are things which are not necessarily untrue, but they're revealing things to people that those people have no business knowing. Proverbs 20, verse 19, he that goeth about as a talebearer revealeth secrets. Therefore, meddle not with him that flattereth with his lips. Don't meddle with these people because these people aren't trustworthy. These people are a problem. These people are going to start problems. Proverbs 26, verses 20 to 22. Where no wood is, there the fire goeth out. Where there is no talebearer, the strife ceaseth. As coals are to burning coals, as wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. The words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. This idea, where there's no wood the fire goes out. Where there is strife, where there is continual strife, there is somebody that is keeping that strife alive. That's what a talebearer does. They're pitting people against one another. They're meddling in other people's affairs. In the name of helping, they bring harm. In the name of informing, they destroy. In the name of passing along speculation, they pass along only strife. They cause trouble where there otherwise would be none. And we know all of this to encompass the broader scriptural teaching of the tongue. And just before we bring this to application, we, we can't bring it to application without going to James chapter 3. James chapter 3, I'm going to read a, a fairly sizable passage about the tongue. Many of you know it well. Verses 2 through 12, the Bible says, for in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man, and able also to bridle his whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our member, members, excuse me, that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and is set on, the fire, on fire of hell. For every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Therewith we bless God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing my brethren. These things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either of vine, figs? 
so can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. We find in these verses exhortations on the power of our words to influence and the power of our words to destroy. Within the direct context, James is speaking to teachers. I skipped verse 1, where it says, Brethren, be not many masters, knowing ye shall receive the greater condemnation. The direct context is saying, don't, don't have a bunch of teachers. Teachers, you're accountable. So you better speak properly. You better be careful what you say. Because words have power. They have power to influence. They have power to direct. But without controversy, the teaching extends to everyone who has a command over language that the words we speak are powerful. You've experienced this, haven't you? You've experienced the power of words to build up and the power of words to destroy. You've experienced those who have said something to you and it has lifted you up and it has compelled you to greater heights of, of obedience, greater heights of motivation, and you've experienced someone who just with their words has torn you down, demotivated you, shamed you, brought you to a place of discouragement. Like matches, which are so small, and yet with them you can kindle a fire which can spread, and damage, and kill. So too is our tongue, a metaphorical reflection of our capacity to influence through our words. We've seen, especially in the last decade, the power of people to destroy lives and ruin careers with their words. Today it's called cancel culture. The idea that somebody can shoot out a tweet on Twitter and a bunch of other people tweet it, and next thing you know, somebody else is getting fired. They lose their career, they lose their family, they lose their, everything that they've worked for because a bunch of people didn't like something he said a while ago or something he stands for. It's the power of language to influence. You can study history and you can see that people have been killed, countries have been toppled, entire empires have crumbled through the power of language and the influence that language can bring about in the lives of others. We have witnessed entire cultures, direction of nations, determinations of whole people change on the basis of one speech. You can read of tens of thousands of lives being changed, of cultures being brought into submission to Christ through a single sermon. Jonathan Edwards reads Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, right? He doesn't even preach it. He reads it. He manuscripts it and reads it. And the Spirit of God moved through the power of, the, the power of the Spirit of God moved through those words and influenced an entire, what we call the Great Awakening. This power, the power of the tongue, is great. And this power should not be one that is used double-mindedly. It should not be used both to bless God and to curse men. It should not be used both to build up and to tear down should be used unto God's ends. To this end, it is not for us to idly gossip. It is not for us to insert ourselves into the information game of which we simply do not belong. It is not for us to meddle in the affairs of others when they're not ours to have. Now, as I say this, and we'll apply in a moment, this is not a call, again, I preached it just a couple of weeks ago, this is not a call to avoid accountability or transparency or honesty. But we do those things willingly. We come together and we invest in one another willingly and we trust one another to the degree that we do so. As I open myself up and I let you into my life, I let you into my needs, then you invest in me and I in you. And then I'm entrusting you with information. And then you have that information. And of course, you could take and abuse that information. And that information could go from your tongue to people that it has no business going to. I counsel with people, people in this body, people outside this body, weekly. And they are telling me what I need to know to help them. But God forbid that then I should take that and distribute it to those that don't need to know. It is not for me to distribute that which is not your business to you. It is not for you to distribute that which is not my business to me. 
to speculate, to gossip, to meddle in the lives of those who have not invited me in. And that's a big difference between accountability, honesty, and transparency and gossip and meddling and busybodiness. And that's the danger of which we speak today. And I'd like to uh, bring about three different points. Uh, and it's kind of one long thought um, leading to a final conclusion, a fourth conclusion or a fourth point, final conclusion, uh, this morning about this concept. First off, we live in an idle culture and let us keep ourselves busy. If you, uh, if you consider what we read in Ezekiel chapter 16 today, pride, idleness of bread, and selfishness, uh, uh, abundance of bread and idleness, excuse me. Pride, abundance of bread and idleness is what led Sodom to the place where they ended up in the, in the deep throes of the sexual perversion in which they found themselves. And this is what we're seeing in our culture as well, isn't it? We are an idle culture. We are a culture that is full of bread. We are a culture that is excessively proud. And it has made us selfish and it has, it has brought about any number of evils, including the very sexual perversion that brought about in Sodom. It is a wonderful thing to live in a pros prosperous culture. It's a real blessing to not have a subsistence living culture where we have to wake up and we have to go out and work because if not, then we're not going to eat that day. And if we have a bad crop, we're in trouble. And if we have a hailstorm, we're in trouble. And if we have you know, any of those, if we have a drought, we're in trouble because we need, we are, we are living off the fruit of every day's labor. We're, it's a blessing that we don't have that. There's a, a drought out in, in the West and they import a little extra food from somewhere else and they're fine. We can make it through the famines and we can make it through the droughts and we have, we have lots of food to spare. It's a blessing that we live in a culture where we can uh, have a couple of weeks of paid vacation every year. That's, that's, a, that's a real blessing uh, that, that, that we can have that. It's a real blessing that you can get leave for your your, your medical problems, and you can get leave for uh, when, when you're having a child, or you can have leave when uh, someone in, in the family passes away to go to their funeral. It's a blessing that we have that kind of flexibility. We live in a wonderful time. It's a great time to be alive. But it doesn't come without its own dangers. The prosperity of our culture has led to a substantial amount of free time, and you know that can be a blessing too. It allows us to go beyond the needs of just our daily bread. Gives us the freedom. We can pour more time into the ones we love. We can pursue hobbies and interests. We can better ourselves in any number of ways. You can uh, take classes and our access to knowledge today is just incredible. And uh, you, can, you can perfect things that you wouldn't otherwise be able to perfect. And you can become far more well-rounded than, than perhaps people of other generations. But it can also tempt us to become idle. To waste our time. And in wasting our time, we open ourselves up to temptations which we would not otherwise have. You know, there's no time for marches and protests in a subsistence living culture. There's no time for that. We've got to go live. We've got to go, we've got to go make food so that we can feed our families. There's no time for all of the bickering back and forth in a subsistence living culture. There's no time for that. We've, we, we're, we're too busy trying to live. We have that time. We need to be careful with that time. When we pull back the curtain on this concept, what we find is that scriptures are playing out in our culture. People are idle and their minds are inevitably drifting toward themselves. They enfold into themselves and they're becoming depressed and they're becoming selfish and they're becoming greedy and, and they, are, they are trying to fill their time. And if you allow a man to fill his time at his own discretion, it's going to lead to sin. So our minds are filled with ourselves and we become selfish and we become proud. And to whatever degree we turn our attention toward others, it's not in service, but it's rather to be served. It's not to bless, but rather to expect a blessing. It's not for the sake of others, but for the sake of ourselves. 
And this is a great evil, and it's an evil rooted in idleness. But when we are determined to keep ourselves busy in the Lord, I'm not talking about overcommitting. I'm not saying, sorry, kids, I can't, I can't give you any time because I'm too busy filling my schedule with other things. No. But when we keep ourselves busy in the Lord, not overcommitting, not overwhelming ourselves, but simply staying busy, righteously busy, filling our time with things that profit, then here's what happens. We say, wow, I've got time on my hands. What am I going to do with it? I need to be profitable. Let's go find someone to serve. Let's go find someone to bless. Inevitably, it's going to come to that. Inevitably, if you choose to, serve, to fill your free time, if you have free time and you choose to fill it and you're going to fill it in a way that pleases the Lord, it will inevitably look like serving others because that is the character of our Lord. So we've got some free time. Let's go see. Let's go rake the neighbor's leaves. Let's go mow their lawn. You know, that sign at the church or that light's been, been out, needs to be fixed. I've got some time. Let's go do that. Filling it. I've got some extra time. Let's go take the kids and we'll go to the lake. Filling it. Serving. Investing. This is a great opportunity for me to take one of the kids and do something with them. We will inevitably bless. We will inevitably serve. We will inevitably edify and fulfill the purpose of the body of Christ. So let us keep ourselves busy. Let's guard ourselves against being idle. Number two, we live in a tattling culture. Let's be deliberate and restrained. Words are everywhere today, aren't they? There's no end to the stream of information. We live in a 24-hour news cycle. Television, radio, internet, there's no end to the noise buzzing about in the culture around us. Social media has not helped this, be it YouTube or Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or any of the other many platforms created to distribute content. What we find is a culture that is conditioned to think that I need to have an opinion on everything and everybody needs to care about it. And both of those are false. So something happens and everyone gives their opinion. We, we, we call it, one of the ways that, one of the things that's called in culture is Monday morning quarterbacking. Comes from the idea of football, right? Where the next day, everybody wakes up on a Monday morning after the football game and they sit around the water cooler and they all say how the coach doesn't know anything and the players don't know anything. And if I were that player or if I were that coach, we would have won that game as if you actually know what it's like to stand down on that field and to face those pressures and to have to think through everything and, and, and as, if, as, as if you actually have any insight whatsoever into what you're talking about. You don't, but that's okay. You don't have to because none of the other guys do too. So you're all there just spouting out stuff you don't know anything about. And that's what we do. That's how culture works. But that's not how we need to work, and especially when it comes to things that legitimately matter. Monday morning quarterbacking, that's a pretty benign example, right? Well, what happens when it comes to things that matter? What happens when you start putting your opinion into things that you know nothing about when it comes to your friends and loved ones? Just keep your mouth shut if you don't know anything about it. The old adage, if you don't have anything to say, don't say anything at all. Goes through another old adage, better to remain silent and be thought a fool, right, than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. It's true, isn't it? We need to guard ourselves deeply against such behaviors. This concept is loosely rooted in biblical wisdom, Proverbs chapter 12, verse 13. The wicked is a snare, is snared, excuse me, by the transgression of his lips, but the just shall come out of trouble. Proverbs 13, 3. He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life, but he that openeth wide his lips shall have destruction. Proverbs 18, 7. A fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are the snare of his soul. Proverbs 21, 23. Whoso keepeth his mouth keepeth his tongue, uh, and his tongue, excuse me, keepeth his soul from troubles. All culminating in a concept which James presents, not in James 3 this time, but in James 1, verse 19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, 
slow to wrath. The wise man, the happy man, is the man who learns to shut his mouth, to hold his tongue, to restrain his thoughts, to condition himself out of the conviction that his opinion is valid or that anyone should care, that he is entitled to a voice, and that his thoughts are always worth sharing. A lot of times they aren't. You can have them, but you don't need to always share them. There's a time to speak and there's a manner in which to speak. But let us be swift to hear, quick to listen, slow to speak, deliberate in expressing my opinion, slow to wrath, slow to form that opinion. The underlying essence of these convictions is humility and patience, characteristics which are of great spiritual value and characteristics which are of inestimable benefit, both to yourself, to your church, to your family, to everyone who will interact with you. We live in an idle culture. Let us be, keep ourselves busy. We live in a tattling culture. Let us be deliberate and restrained. Third, we live in a meddling culture. Let us keep to that which is ours to keep. This point follows right in line with the last. In this social media culture, we are very quick to put our noses into business which is not our own. Social media has just made it worse. For the last many, many years, of course, the entertainment industry the tabloid industry has pushed this, right? Getting into the affairs of others. Politicians, celebrities, athletes, whatever it is, you want to know all the grizzly, grizzly details. Paparazzi, following them around, taking pictures, bugging them all the time, never any privacy, never any rest. We have grown up in cultures that are used to this. Well, if you're, if you're famous, you better just get used to us meddling in your affairs because we want to know all the juicy gossip. Look, it's not right. Don't let it boil over into your life. This is not the way we ought to live. One of the things I find somewhat entertaining is when I'm watching, uh, perhaps on YouTube or something, a clip regarding some political controversy in this country, and I read comments from people in Europe or from Australia or, or even Canada telling us how messed up our system is and how we need to reform it. And we do the same thing. We look at Europe and we say, ah, oh, this and that. And, and, and you know, at the end of the day, they're speaking to something that they know nothing about. They have no idea the cultural battles we're facing over here. They have no idea the reason for the decisions that we're making. Those people in Europe have no clue what we're dealing with here. Now, we can talk philosophically about those things, but you know what? You really don't know what you're talking about, so stop meddling. But we all do this, don't we? All the time. and this spirit undergirds our own interactions. We gossip about one another. We tell people things which are none of their business, perhaps none of our own business to even to know. We formulate opinions and we seek to interject ourselves where they don't belong. And as with everything, we consider this concept with a measure of balance. When I hear of a brother in need and I think I can help, there's a manner in which I can go about inquiring as to the validity of that need, right? Hey, I heard about something. You go and you very discreetly say, hey, do you need some help? Is there some way I can help you? I, 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 I didn't try to hear this. I didn't want to hear this, but I heard that you might need some help. Is, is any of this true? You hear some juicy bit of gossip about somebody. So-and-so said what, did what, went where? There's a way of finding out if it's true without having to go and ask every single other person in church. Did you hear about that? Do you know if that's true? Not the right way to go about it. You want to know, you need to know if it's true? You can go to that person and ask. Tactfully, resp respectfully. If you don't need to know, then you can just drop it. And you should. It's not anyone else's business. And if it's not yours, it's not yours. In a culture such as ours, we need to guard ourselves because meddling has become commonplace. Being a busybody has become almost the norm. We need to guard ourselves against getting into others' affairs where we have no business. We do, so, we do this for any number of reasons. Not all of them are necessarily nefarious, right? But it's dangerous. 
When I involve myself in other people's problems, I can successfully distract from my own, and that's one of the reasons why sometimes we'll do that. When I involve myself in other people's business, I can cause damage where damage wouldn't otherwise be done. When I involve myself in others' business, for whatever reason I do so, I put myself in a dangerous place. Our Lord spoke to a point regarding this in Matthew chapter 7. When Jesus says in verses 1 through 5 of Matthew 7, Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. With what measure ye meet, it shall be meted to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, and considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the, the, uh, uh, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and, um, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. We find here a helpful hint as to when it is and how it is that we go about bringing ourselves into a brother's circumstances or situation. I just mentioned a moment ago, one of the tendencies that we have, one of the reasons why humans like to meddle is because when we meddle in other people's affairs, it can distract us. I can avoid working on my own issues if I'm meddling in the issues of others. I can ignore the pangs of my own conscience if I'm busy being someone else's conscience. I find this in the jail a lot. Someone will come to me and they'll start talking about everyone else in the jail and their problems. And then I look at them and I say, so why are you here? They don't want to talk about why they're there. They want to talk about why everyone else is there. We do that too, don't we? I have a problem. I don't want to think about my own spiritual issues. So let's just talk about their issues. Let's meddle into their affairs. Let's Let's, let's gossip about their problems. Jesus called this judgmentalism. He speaks of a circumstance where we are imposing our judgment upon another man. And we're doing so at the expense of our own problems. You want to help that man? Well, get yourself right and then go to them in love and see if you can help them. It doesn't help them to impose our judgment, our opinions upon them. If we have anything constructive to offer to the situation, let us do this first. Let us focus our time and energy upon our own concerns. And once those are well in hand, then in humility and grace, then I might see clearly enough to help a brother in a proper context. We've spoken of other possible reasons for meddling. One of the things we find in this culture is that uh, we, we live in a sitcom culture. Perhaps a number of us and, and, and uh, the vast majority of people within our culture grew up watching sitcoms. And the funny thing about a sitcom is that every episode has to have drama or else it gets boring, right? When, you are, when, when, when the essence of a television show is just tracing a person's life, right? Tracing a family. In order to make that interesting, every week has to be family drama. And so what do we grow up learning? That if there's no drama, we're bored. That if there's no drama, then there's something wrong in our lives. And so people start to manufacture drama. And a great way to do this is to meddle. You manufacture drama, and, and in doing so, you feel as though you're living. It's a problem. It should not be named among us. Matchmakers. They're meddlers into love dramas, right? Romantic notions. Desires to play out a measure of their desires through seeing other people come together. Talebearers. Often want to cover their own pain by seeing others dragged into their pain and sorrow as well. Come join me in my misery. We could likely list any number of other motivations for those who love to meddle where they do not belong. But we hasten on to our concluding thought this morning. We live in an idle culture. Let us keep ourselves busy. We live in a tattling culture. Let us be deliberate and restrained. We live in a meddling culture. Let us keep that which is ours to keep, all for the benefit of those we love and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. That we may have a good testimony among them that are without and that we may live, Paul said in, in 1 Thessalonians. 
The warnings of scripture leave no doubt that idle gossip, bearer of tales, busy bodies, this is a person who is going to do damage to the life and emotions and spirit of others. For the sake of those you claim to love, it is imperative that you learn to stay busy and to bridle your tongue. God help each of us not to have to see the day when our loose tongue or our idle life has caused us to deeply wound the people that we love. God help each of us that we would not see the day that our church is wounded by idle words, biting words, division, dissent, words designed to cut, but deeper still, God forbid that the outside world should look at us as believers who claim the name of Christ living in such a manner. God forbid that we should reflect such a dismal, awful testimony upon our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What must the world think of the church when we act that way? What damage must be done to the testimony of Jesus Christ when we live idly, when we speak many words unto vanity, and when we meddle in other people's affairs? So that we fail at that which Paul exhorted the church of Thessalonica to do, to study, to be quiet, to do our own business, and to work with our hands. So the question is, how are you doing today? I think th this is a message that not one of us should walk away without any thing on our mind. We live in a culture that is meddlesome, that is idle, that is proud. That culture is headed down the road of Sodom. We know that. that that's not even a speculation, right? That's, that's just a statement of fact. And we are called to walk the road of Christ. We see the direction that idleness and that pride takes us. We see the direction that this meddling and this tendency to being a busybody, this looseness of the tongue takes us. Is there something that the Lord has placed upon, uh, that, that, that he has he's placed his thumb upon in your life that needs to change? Does there need to be some reorienting of, of your lifestyle to change an idleness about you? Does there need to be a restraining of your tongue to do a little more thinking and a little less talking? Does there need to be a, a correction of a meddling spirit? Your desire to interject yourself into the lives and, and concerns of others that needs to be stripped out of you so that you, you study to be quiet and you do your own business. Paul spoke of these dangers as it related to these widows who were under 60 years old, he says, who would spend some time in this state of, of, of being provided for by the church, of not having anything necessarily to direct her uh, uh, attentions to, but that it would cause her to become idle. It would tempt her to become idle and to become wanton against Christ. Let us guard ourselves against these things. In a society conducive to being idle, let us find ways to stay righteously busy. In a society full of empty words, let us be swift to hear, slow to speak. In a society that loves to meddle, let us study to be quiet and to do our own business and to work with our own hands. We combine this with what we learned two weeks ago so that we don't say that we should not invest in one another. But simultaneously, we don't step outside of that which is ours to keep. Thank you for listening to Pastor Jamin Wickler from Legacy Baptist Church in Buffalo, Minnesota. More information about Legacy Baptist Church and a library of sermons are available at www.legacybaptistchurch.net.